Well, good evening, everybody. There we go. Hey, hey, it's good to be with you after a weather event that was different. This has been uh, every, every kind of weather possible weekend. And I believe I saw a cowardly lion at one point. It was crazy, wasn't it? It was really, really crazy. Just a, a substantial, just to show a hands here. How many people lost power last night? Oh, that's nice. We, you are the hardiest people in the world. Or did you just come here to charge your phones? Is that, <laughs> what's going on here? No, no, it was, that was crazy. You know, it is, it is something so dramatic how, the, how powerful the weather can be. And I think it's pretty helpful if we're just starting to ramp up again for this convoy, one day to feed the world offering. These people roll into town when a town is hit by a tornado. And if you felt it a little bit, you know, think about when it was, you know, way worse. When a hurricane hits, when an earthquake hits, when a tornado hits. What you would want is for somebody to respond. You'd want some help from the outside. Um, this last year, we, we were prepared. It was a terrible year with weather-wise and disaster-wise. And we had prepared. We, were, we, had, we had put the tools in people's hands to respond to those things. And I, I hope you'll be a part of that. I mean, both of our announcements kind of went together where the one guy said, it's better to love than be true or something like that. Like, you know, I, I think they go together, being true and loving. But uh, without love, uh, the truth is uh, pretty stale. So listen, let's dig in here. We're going to take a look at 1 Thessalonians 1. This is Paul writing to a church that he cared about, a church that started with a riot. The early days of uh, uh, the Thessalonican church uh, started with Paul coming in, had a little bit of progress, and then he was booted out of town. Uh, you can see that story in Acts 17. But here's Paul, years later, writing back to that church. To the church of the Thessalonians, and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you, and we continually mention you in our prayers. We remember for our, before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he's chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcome the message in the midst of severe suffering with joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. And the Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God's become known everywhere. And therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Can you pray with me? Father, it's in my heart that um, the gospel would ring out from us. I just pray that you would form our church in such a way that there would be like this, this um, you know, kind of a wave of what is going on over there. How is it these people are filled with power and filled with love? How is it they, they're, they're able to change? How, how is it that this, this group here is like a group from heaven? And we ask you, Lord, to come and, and fill my words. I pray that this would be not simply words, but words with power, with the Holy Spirit, with conviction. I give you my work here, Lord, and we all come together here. We're, we're trying to follow Jesus together. We ask you, Lord, that we would be like the, uh, the church at Thessal uh, Thessalonica. We ask, Lord, that you would make us uh, exemplary. We ask that we as individuals would be examples to those young among us, to those who are still considering faith. We pray that they would find us to be like Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, I want to say hi to our friends over at Morton. It's good to be with you. I loved worshiping with you last week. And uh, it's good to get into this scripture. We're in 1 Thessalonians, the whole chapter 1 here. We're doing a series now called What, uh, what Makes the Good News Good? What is it about the gospel that's, that's good? It's, 
Uh, in the Greek, I told you the, the word that we translate gospel just means good news. Sometimes your Bible will, will say good news. Other times it will say gospel. This particular uh, passage says our gospel came to you not simply with words but with power and with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. And you know how we lived among you for your sake. Our gospel, our good news, the thing that was in our mouths, the thing that got us into trouble. When they come in, in, in Acts 17, when they come into this town, you can see that they, they get a, a real pushback from people who uh, made a lot of money with idols. They literally made money off of idols, selling idols, the worship of idols. And there was a tons of pushback. And the accusation came, these people are turning the world upside down. And uh, it, the truth was they were turning the world upside down, or they were turning the world right side up. What is the good news? What does this mean? Well, the, the gospel is what we do when we, when we share good news. I have a friend that was accepted into Yale recently. And uh, when she was accepted, she enjoyed it. She shared among her friends, I've been accepted into Yale. Good news. And that was very good news. Everybody celebrated except for me because she's my assistant. And I'm going to lose her out of the deal, okay? It was great news, though. And there's a, there's a spirit of that. And, and what I've said to you and what I think we all kind of know is not all, we don't always uh, get that same association with the gospel, right? Like if you, if you just say, well, I, I'd like to do some evangelism at the party today. Maybe your host would say, D could you not? Could you not? Or if you just say, I'm an evangelical, okay, I've, I've got the gospel, I've got the good news, I'm, a, I'm like an angel filled with good news, can I share it with you on campus or with this sign or on TV? And uh, that's not the, the, the best thing to be called these days, not necessarily. Okay, that's the gospel, this evangel, this good news that we have. It's, it's, uh, sometimes it's shared well, sometimes it's not shared well. My, my roommate and I, in, in, in my senior year at uh, Westchester University, my roommate and I were in our apartment just enjoying an evening, and two people came to the door. They seemed nice enough. And they asked us, could they do a survey? Well, I said, sure, you can do a survey. Go ahead, you know, whatever. I, college student, I didn't have a lot to do. I certainly didn't want to do homework. And so I, they started a survey, and quickly, my roommate and I, who were both Christians at this time, detected that they were trying to lead us to the Lord. But there was nothing in their uh, patter that enabled them to detect the fact that we weren't Christians. So we kind of looked at each other and we said, let's just you know, keep, keep going. We strung that thing out for like 45 minutes, tried to get these people to lead us to the Lord. We were already Christians. We're <laughs> and at the end we said, you know, we're already Christians. They said, oh, it was like there wasn't a question for that on their survey. With it. They had, it was a whole technique. It was like sort of a fake survey. Like, it seems to me like if you're going to do a survey, the survey actually has to be used as a survey for it to be legitimate, right? Okay, but that was one technique. They had a, a technique. But the good news is what comes out of our mouth as we try to talk to people about God. It's really tricky, and a lot of us just think, like, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how we can do that. And in coming weeks, we're going to talk a lot about the words. But just to start, let's think about what the words are. We're going to talk a lot about how, how I talk about the gospel, how Jesus talked about the gospel, uh, how Paul talked about the, the gospel. But it seems to me, if we're going to just start, out, we're going to have to listen a little bit like the survey people didn't. We're going to have to think it's good ourselves. I had a friend in college when a, little bit, a couple years earlier when I wasn't a believer who said this uh, to me. Once I walked in on him, he was a painting studio. He was in a, student, a studio all by himself. And he had broken his right arm. He was painting with his left hand. And he wasn't a very popular guy. And, and I kind of was in the in crowd there. And I, and I just, just went into him and I, you know, blessed him with acknowledging his existence. Because I was kind of impressed. I was like, Bruce, how did you, how, how can you be painting with your left hand? He said, well, I can do everything through Christ who strengthens me. And it was just like a simple little acknowledgement of scripture. It's actually a little out of context scripture, as I know now. But still, it was so genuine. It was so genuine. It just came right out of his mouth like, well, I can do it because I'm getting help from God. And he probably thought, oh, that didn't matter at all to that guy. But actually, 
during that time, there was a group of people who were sharing the gospel with me and were including me in their little circle as we were studying C.S. Lewis and it had a tremendous impact. I always tell people this, it felt like an arrow went into my heart. Like, here's what I did. I like walked out of the studio like, cool, you know, because I was cool, right? I walk out and I'm like, oh, man, what, what is it with that guy? That guy's got something I don't have. And that's really what I was thinking a lot in those days. That some people had something I didn't have. What are the words that Jesus used? Well, Jesus would often talk about the gospel like this. The kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus didn't usually start. In fact, I don't think he ever started with God loves you. You're a sinner and you better get your act right. You better learn the right theology. You better say the right thing. So at your worst moment, God won't reject you. That's not the fullest version of the gospel. What Jesus said is this, the kingdom of God is at hand. God is making everything the way God wants it. Repent and believe. The word repent just means to turn around, get on with this, just pay attention to this. The kingdom of God, I, I'll sometimes say it like this, God is making everything new. And then as a, if you get a chance to go, get into a little bit more, with the coming of Jesus, he was announcing that that new making was starting right then. And at the death and resurrection of Jesus, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, is this kind of turning point of all of history, all of reality, turns around Jesus coming into the world. And as Jesus talked about the good news, he's like, look, it's happening right now. And you can be a part of it. And the way he said you could be a part of it is he said, repent. Turn around, get right on. It's like God's making everything new. More than one car was crushed last night, right? If you were the owner of a car and you came outside and saw your car all crushed up, okay, first of all, sorry. Show of hands how many cars were crushed. If that happened, you're pretty down about it. If your car got made new in front of you, that'd be pretty good. Most of the people on the planet would say, this world somehow has got crushed. Somehow there's something wrong with this world. What, what can happen? You're standing in a line at the checkout, you know, at the grocery store or something like that, and newspapers in front of you or whatever. You just think, what's the world coming to? Lots of people have that question. Like, why, why is everything so bad? Well, it's a good news starting point to say, God's doing something about this. God's doing something and making it new. And I think that's a great entry place. God is making everything new. And he's very close to the way Jesus started talking about the gospel. Jesus rarely started talking about the gospel, like what's going to happen to you after you die. Now, let me say this. What's going to happen to you after you die is a great part of the good news. And I talked to a man uh, in our parking lot this week who, who lost his wife of 68 years in a, a car crash. And, and he just said, I, I'm undone. He says, I go to sleep as early as I can go to sleep. I just try to get sleep. And he's just, he's heartbroken. But he said, I know she's with the Lord. And I know I'll see her again. So that is a fantastic part of the gospel. That is good news. That even the worst enemy of humanity, death itself, is... Is, uh, is, is undone, is turned around by the great gospel of the kingdom of God, which Jesus goes and he dies, and he goes first, and he's raised. And if we would want to, we can be a part of it. I think that's what Jesus meant when he said, repent. Repent, turn around, get on. This is happening now. Do you want to be a part of it? And I've told you this story before, but just because I love this story, I'll tell you again, it's a story of I was sledding over here. When the kids were little, we were sledding on this big hill uh, right in the park over here. We would have a good time doing that. And uh, every year I would feel older and older. Every year I would enjoy the, uh, the landing of the sled just a little bit less, right? It was a really good time. And one time, uh, the, the boys and I were, were all going over a jump at once. And the, John went over and he, whoo! John went over, woo! Okay, I went over, boom! And I, I like exploded. And I, I was laying there, and I was like picking up all the stuff. You know that kind of yard sale thing where stuff's all over the place? And I, I'm, I'm picking it up, and I heard a little noise like, shh, you know, a little noise like that. I was like, shh. And then I heard some like giggling and stuff like that. And I, and I turn around, I turn around, like just in time to see the biggest inner tube I've ever seen filled with like six kids coming, and it's coming right at me. 
I like had only a couple options. Like one of the options was to bail. One of the options was to get hit. And I think when Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand, he's saying something like this. It is here. You either get on or get out of the way or whatever you want to do. Get on. You can't stay in charge anymore. The actual king of the universe is making everything. Everything is broken. Everything is broken in your life. Everything is broken in the world. You can be a part of this. Now, you got to get your own sledding story, but I would suggest talking about the gospel more like that. Sounds like good news. You can be a part of the new making of all things. And it includes you. And you can't stay old you and be a part of this. Jesus has come for you. And you can be a part of this. It will, it will cost you everything in a way. Like, you can't both continue on as it is and get on the, the kingdom of God's sled. You have to do one or the other. And one of the amazing things in the Bible is this crazy thought that you don't have to be a part of it. Somehow in God's grace, your will is important to the whole thing. You can be a part of it or you can't be a part. Like it's come, Jesus comes with announcement. I've gotten into Yale. Good news. The kingdom of God is here. Good news. And the job of the church, the job of Christians, is to carry that in their lives, in their words, to be new people, to be uh, kinds of people that are a part of that, who have actually gotten on. And again, I, I'll say this as soberly as I can. I know I'm like telling funny stories and everything. It seems like you can miss this. Uh, the end of the passage here says, His coming wrath. It seems like there's a way to let the sled go by. But I want to get on. I want you to get on, too. Paul comes and he reasons with the Thessalonians. He, he, he reasons with them. He says, Christ has lived. Christ has died. Christ had to suffer, but he's risen again. And with that resurrection, this thing that we're about to celebrate at Easter... We are going to celebrate that day when all things began to be made new. He is the firstborn from among the dead. And that sled comes along and you can be a part of it. You don't have to reject it. And then all through the, the Bible then, you see that when this story is told, it's not just with words. And when Paul speaks about this gospel, he says, you know, we didn't just talk, did we? There was power. The other part of this was there was power. Something happened. When this story goes forward, God accompanies it like with the new making, new making signs. Sometimes they're called in the Bible signs and wonders. This idea that the new breaks into the now. And it's kind of fantastic. And Paul says, look, when we came, we came not just with words, simply with words, but with power, with the Holy Spirit, with deep conviction. And if you look at the the early church, especially as expressed in the book of Acts, the characteristic that you would see is there's the proclamation, the announcement of the gospel, and then the deeds of the gospel, or the words of the gospel, as John Wimber used to say, and the works of the gospel, like the good news would kind of happen. The dead would be raised, the, the blind would see, the lame would jump up and start dancing. And we believe now that that's our, our heritage, that's what we are, we are Good news, people, we've gotten on to something. Paul says this in Ephesians. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened. I'm going to jump down, because he names a bunch of things, but to his incomparably great power for those of us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly realms. Paul says, you know, one of my prayers for you as Christians and one of my prayers for us as a church is that we would keep uh, grasping our new identity in Christ. That the same power dwells in us that uh, dwells in, in uh, raised Jesus from the dead. Now that is about as amazing as a verse could be. We come here on a Sunday night or Saturday night, and you're just trying to figure things out, or you're, you're over there mourning, you're just thinking, ah, oh, you know, maybe I'll go get a coffee. Listen, here's the deal the same power's in you that raised Christ from the dead. Now, 
seems like our job then is to like figure out how does, how does this actually go with real life? Our job is to get on board with this gospel of the kingdom, this good news that God is making all new. And then we're supposed to be sort of part of the new making. We're supposed to be part of the expression of resurrection power wherever we go and whatever we do. And we, we often teach you to pray this prayer or to, to ask this question, can I pray for you right now? The word that's used here is uh, uh, dunamis. You've probably heard it's one of those Greek words that often gets explained in sermons. And people say that's the same word that dynamite comes from, which is true. Um, I, I don't really like, I don't have a lot of experience with dynamite. But it's also the same word that dynamic comes from. In other words, evidence of life. There's a sense that something's dynamic, it's changing, it's growing. You might ask yourself, how have I changed recently? Has God's spirit changed me in any way? Sometimes in the middle of the night, I breathe so lightly that my wife will nudge me to see if I've got any dunamis in me. And is there anything dynamic about this guy, or is this the night, right? <laughs> She'll give me this little nudge. She's saying, anything dynamic about this? And there's probably some churches in the world where you just sort of have to give them a little nudge to see, is there anything actually dynamic? Paul constantly, the early church is constantly dealing in some kind of dynamism, some kind of life, like life, but some other kind of life from something more alive than what we're used to. I want to show you a video here. It's a video of a, a, a church that we've heard of, we know, we've heard good reports from this church from friends of ours that have visited this church. It's a, a church in Colerain, Ireland, and uh, they've been uh, instrumental in experimenting on praying for people in their town square. And at this point, my friend told me, uh, when he visited there, there's people taking buses to come see. The guy who's led this effort is a humble guy named Mark Marx, Mark Marx, uh, not, not from the uh, boy group, no, not Marky Mark, <laughs> all right? And uh, Mark's going to tell just one story of something that happened. Excited to be here. So, Mark, can you maybe just give us a little bit of background on who you are, where you're from, and how yeah. Healing on the Streets got started? Great. Well, hello, everyone. I have to say, I'm actually nervous about being here. I'm an introvert, and uh, I know that sounds crazy that God's called me to be an evangelist, but I'm shy and introverted. Amazing. And, and you're going to see every time you go out, you will see people um, touched by God's power and by His love, by His presence. We are washing the feet of our community, sharing God's love. But what happened was that um, last year I had a, an email from a mother. Her name is Kim Martin. And she was um, sharing about her son, her 14-year-old boy, whose name is Josh Martin. And she said that Josh has an, um, an aggressive, incurable um, cancer which um, he's been in, he's had for the last six months, he's been in hospital for the last six months. He's had several operations to remove golf ball sized tumors from his stomach because this particular type of cancer just tries to find every available cavity or space in his body and just fills it, doubles in size in incredible rates. So this poor lad has been going through one operation after another as, as these golf ball size um, tumors appear in his body uh, there were there was one tumor the size of a grapefruit some other tumors that were, that were inoperable he'd had several courses of chemotherapy and basically had come to a place he was in terrible he'd been in constant pain he had lost uh, so much weight he was very very thin um, the chemo was only to keep him alive for an extra two to three weeks and basically, they'd come to a place where the doctors had said to Kim, we're really sorry, there's nothing more we can do for Josh. And they'd really sent him home to die. Um, Josh believes in Jesus. Uh, Kim said, Josh believes in Jesus, loves Jesus, and believes that Jesus uh, can heal him. But we haven't told him that this cancer is terminal. And with that understanding uh, that we haven't told him, would it be possible for you to pray for him and the team to pray for him if we brought him um, to Healing on the Streets on Saturday? And we said, we would love to pray for Josh. So <clears throat> Josh came with in a wheelchair because he has no strength. He can't walk. He's in terrible pain. He has no hair because of chemo. 
Uh, he comes with his mother, who is a Christian. His grandmother is not a believer. In fact, she's a, a, a skeptic. And they pushed Josh towards us. And I, when I first saw Josh, I could see he was, he was uh, incredibly ill, but I could see the shadow over his life, which I would have, co- would have identified as a spirit of death. And uh, anyway, we knelt at the feet of Josh. The team knelt around his feet, and they prayed their best prayer for Josh to be healed, taking authority over this, uh, this cancer. When I looked into Josh's eyes, I could still see this shadow there. And I thought, if we let him go now, his next journey will be to the Lord. He's not going to survive this. So I said to Josh, Josh, where, where is the pain in your body? Where is it hurting you most of all? And he said, it's in my, in my spine, and it's going into my hip and down my leg. So I said, Josh, <clears throat> would you mind just sitting back in your wheelchair Sit square in your, in your chair and let me check your legs. And I pulled his legs out, and one leg appeared shorter than the other. And I said, Josh, now keep your eyes open and watch what, what is about to happen, because I believe that what is going to happen to your leg now is an outward sign of what Jesus is doing on the inside of you. I believe God is going to make your leg grow. So as I brought his legs out, his grandmother, who's not a believer and a skeptic, is watching me like a hawk. <laughs> Any funny business, and I'll catch and I'll catch him out, you know. So as I held his feet up, I began to pray my best prayer. I commanded the pain to go. I commanded the, the cancer to shrivel and die. As his leg began to grow out, his Josh said, my pain's going, the pain's going. And as the leg grew out completely to the same length, he said with a smile on his face, The pain's gone. And when I looked into his eyes, the shadow had gone as well. Josh jumped out of the wheelchair, and he began to dance in the diamond square. His his mother was weeping. His grandmother was in tears as well. And and he pushed the uh, wheelchair back to the car park where the car's parked, helped fold it and lift it into... um, the boot. Remember, he's had no strength. He can't walk. He's in pain. Pain's gone. He has strength. He, um, it was the last time he ever got back into that wheelchair, apart from one time when he attempted a wheelie, as any 14-year-old would want to do. <laughs> I like the last line a ton. I like the line that he said. Um, he said something a little fast, as though it was their motto, like he said it 4,000 times. He said, we are washing the feet of our community to uh, demonstrate the, 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 the pre- God's presence and love, which is amazing. The humility. One of the, one of the, one of the things I love about these folks is they are is like zero flash people. It really, he's an introvert, he said at the beginning, just zero flash. They kneel down to serve people in prayer. They kneel before they pray for people. There's, there's nothing more. And my friend who visited that church said um, that a storekeeper who is not part of the church said, our entire town considers this church that does this the biggest asset of our town. Okay, Because it, it's a place of, of this dynamic, of the, the, the presence of God. When pa- Paul talks to the Thessalonians, he says, look, we told you the gospel. We used words. But we also demonstrate the power of God. And not only that, but he says the, the power of God to convict. Um, you know, this, this uh, two weeks ago was the death of Billy Graham. And his funeral was this week. And uh, Billy Graham is a man who cooperated with the Holy Spirit. And he would say that the, the, the impact of his life was because the Spirit of God would shine a light on people when he spoke. And that's what conviction is. Conviction is this, is when the truth is being said, it's like a light is shining on your heart and the Spirit is just showing you, you need to turn to God. Maybe that's even happening right now for somebody in the room. You're you're thinking, I need what they're talking about right now. I need, this is what Graham said. He said, first, the work of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of our sin. When he came, he, when he come, when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. He uses a mother's prayers, a tragic experience, a pastor's sermon, amen, right? 
or some other experience to convict us of sin and of our need to, to run our lives over to Jesus Christ. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. He points to us and says, you are a sinner. You need to repent. We don't like to hear that, but that's the work of the Spirit. Now, that's the words of a man we don't know, normally associate with the Holy Spirit, but it was right at the center of his ministry and even wrote a book uh, about the Holy Spirit. The truth is, throughout his ministry, people would flood in response to the gospel to say, I need what God is doing. That new thing that's happening in many different ways it's been said over the years, people would say, I need the newness of God to happen to me. When Paul talks, he says, listen, we come with words, we come with power, and then he speaks about lives. And I think this is really what Chris was talking about last week. Remember, our friend Chris Schlatterbeck was here and he was talking about new shoes. Well, what he was talking about was this. He was talking about that our lives have to demonstrate the changing impact of God for our words to have much credibility. And when I talked to you two weeks ago, I said at the very end of the sermon, there are two things that give credibility to our words. That sense that God is alive, that God is doing things, that there's a dynamic at hand. Can I pray for you right now? Can we see what God wants to do right now about this situation and transformed lives? If we want to pray a prayer like God, lead many people into your kingdom through our church, it'll have to start changing uh, with us. Paul says this, he says, uh, you know how we lived among you for your sake. And then onward, it says, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. In other words, there's something about Paul's life where he became a new man. And people started imitating his life. Paul, by the way, wasn't, wasn't shy about saying, hey, watch me as I follow Christ. I'm going to give it my best shot. I'm going to follow Christ. I'm going to cooperate with the Spirit's work at me. And you can pay attention to me and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll change together. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. You welcome this message, even with severe uh, suffering. You had joy given by the Holy Spirit, and then you became a model to all the believers in that whole region. That's the way it's supposed to go. You, you turn, you give yourself over to Christ, and he starts changing you in such a way that we become examples for other people. And it's our lives that we, we usually have much more time to express the gospel with our lives than we have with our words. The words come along to give some definition uh, to our lives. And that's what uh, Chris was talking about last week. You're going to have to take off the old to do the new. And if we're going to do any kind of like a, just increase evangelistic impact, that's my big ask. Some of you are doing this uh, leap of faith with us. And one of the things that we, we said to ask something big. My big ask is that we would change the evangelistic potency of our ch church. That the good news would ring out of us like it says there. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Um, therefore, we don't need to say anything about it. Where does it say, where does it say ring out? Oh, the, the, verse 8. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and okay, Your faith has become known everywhere. What would happen if we just said, God, we want everything you want. God, we want our church to help people come into relationship with you. God, your kingdom's come. We've benefited from it, but it's not just for us, is it? We want to follow you. We want to imitate you. We want to follow those who are, are role models for me. And may I just say, one of my role models is here, Bill, Bill Meyer, a guy who early on gave me a person I could, conceive, he's, uh, I could consider, like, this is what it's like to be a thoughtful Christian. Bill is Barb's brother, and I'm just so honored that he's here today. One of the absolute stars of my life who showed me you can think and be a Christian. I had this idea in my mind that you'd have to just sort of like, I don't know, like b b believe in a fairy tale to be a Christian. And then I met a smart Christian, thoughtful Christian, a good man who is still to this day is one of my, my, my dear friends and, and my brother in the Lord. I'm so grateful to have you here today, man. I'm so grateful for your impact in my life. All right. So if we're going to do this evangelism stuff, we'll have to use words, of course. We'll have to get better with our words, and we'll talk more about that. But we're going to, we're going to lean into the Holy Spirit, and we're going to live lives that would ring out some good news message. I want to give you a couple things to try as we walk away from this. One, I'm going to give you an experiment with words. As I've conceived of this, I imagine three levels of people in the room. Um, 
you don't like to talk a lot about Jesus or whatever, this first question is for you. Or this first option. Like, I want to get you to use your words. The next two are harder, so this is yours. You're going to want to grab this one. Mention that you went to church this weekend. Okay? Pretty low bar. Just mention it to somebody else. Okay? If you want to, jack it up a little. And that it's an important part of your life. I went to church and nobody made me. Okay? Something like that. <laughs> Level two. Say something like this. Hey, I'm starting to think about Jesus a little differently. It's starting to fill out for me a little bit. I, I'm thinking this thing. Oh, yeah? What is it? Oh, I don't know. He didn't tell me what to say next. But just, <laughs> okay. Number three, you could say something like this. I think God has a plan. I think he's making everything new. Oh, tell me more. All right, well, and then you go into a sermon. Okay, what, what listen, <laughs> out of your real life, out of your real words, nobody needs something slick. What, what, what the world needs is somebody would talk about this sometime. We talk about everything. Let's talk about our faith. Let's talk about Jesus, okay? Here's another one. Let's, let's push into power. May it be said that here at Blue Root Vineyard, people experience the power of God. We teach you to pray this seven-word question. Can I pray for you right now? It's, it comes from a belief that God would actually do something if people pray. Not like our thoughts and prayers are with you. With you. It's like, can I pray for you right now? Let's, let's pray for that headache. Let's pray for that situation with your child, whatever. Can I pray for you right now? And lastly, your life. Like the Thessalonians. The Thessalonians, turn to God from idols and serve the, true, the living and true God. The story that rang out was these people used to, used to follow the stupidest little images of animals or whatever, made out of gold. And then they came to know the living God, and everything changed. Why don't you stand up? We'll pray together.